Today we're in chapter 15, verses 35 through 49, and uh, we're going to be looking at the subject of glorified bodies. And so, begin reading, we'll begin reading at verse 35, and uh, I'll just read to verse 49 and we'll get into our study. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 35. Someone will say, how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come? Foolish one. What you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. But there's one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fish, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. But the glory of the celestial is one, the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. So in a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body, there's a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward, the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven, as was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now the Corinthians, as we've been studying 1 Corinthians here, the Corinthian, a Greek church, the Corinthians, were dealing with questions about resurrection, the resurrection from the dead. As I've mentioned to you, the Greek thinkers of their day thought that such an idea, the idea of resurrection, was absolutely ridiculous. Uh, we have looked at uh, the section where the Apostle Paul was in the city of Athens, and I've mentioned to you already how that, while he was waiting for some traveling companions to arrive, that he was grieved in his heart because the city, the entire city, was wholly given over to idolatry. And that was the impetus, that was the motivating factor in his life to begin to share the gospel. And as he began to share concerning Jesus Christ and resurrection, there were those who were listening. And some of those who were listening were the philosophers, the Stoics and Epicureans. And as they were listening to him speak and share these things, they amongst themselves discussed this new thing that was being spoken of and seeing that they were those who enjoyed hearing some new thing and that's what they like to speak about, they invited him to come to an area there in Athens that is called Mars Hill. And up in Mars Hill, they invited him to communicate because that's where these who were purveying new thought or new philosophy, that's where they were invited to come so that they could hear their thoughts and then debate the merit of their thoughts and all. And so they invited the uh, Apostle Paul to come up to this area called Mars Hill in order that he might share with them. And as he went up into Mars Hill, he began to look around and he saw how they had many statues there that were dedicated to various gods and all. And so he began by simply sharing with them that he saw that they were very religious. He said, in the King James, you're very superstitious because I've noted that you have all of these uh, places of worship, these statues that you uh, have that basically represent your gods. And I noticed that you have this one that is just set up that doesn't have an image of any God there. It simply says to the unknown God. And he says, and so, it's this unknown God that I've come to speak to you about. And as he began to share with them, he began to speak concerning God and how God worked through sending his son, Jesus Christ. And, and it says in Acts chapter 17, verses 31 and 32, as Paul was speaking, concerning God, he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. 
When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. Some of them sneered. They said, this is ridiculous, this idea of resurrection. And that turned them off because the concept of being resurrected from the dead for the intellectual was absolutely ridiculous. Now, that knowledge of this may be influencing the way Paul begins to deal with the resurrection in this particular portion of Scripture. Because in verse 35, notice how he says, someone will say, how are the dead raised up? So he begins to answer questions here. And the first question that he answers is, how are the dead raised? See, the question could be, what is God going to do with dead bodies? Does he reassemble those bodies who have died? How do you reassemble a decayed body? How's that going to take place? What kind of power is involved in such a feat as this? How is it even possible that a body that has been placed into the ground and has slowly but surely decomposed, how is it possible that this body will be reassembled? That is not a new thought. That's not an original thought because um, that kind of question is still asked to this day. There are still people who are wondering about that. There are still people who are questioning that. What if somebody is surfing and he gets eaten by a shark? What's going to happen? What happens when somebody is cremated and they spread their ashes into the ocean? And so, you know, you can see the logic of that. That's not a ridiculous question. That's actually a good question. What about that? What if somebody got eaten by a lion? Is the lion going to be resurrected too? I mean, people begin to ask questions like that. And here's a very simple answer to that. Shut up. That is so stupid. No. There you go. How can God reassemble those bodies? It's been said it is no more difficult to restore a body than it is to create one in the first place. Your God is too small. If that's the kind of question that is a hang up, your God is too small. We believe that God created man out of the dust of the earth. So why would that be such a difficult thing for him to reassemble a body? Why would that be so mysterious? What kind of God do we serve? What kind of God do we worship? If if God is up in heaven, we'll say just kind of thinking, man, what am I going to do? That shark ate that guy. Now how am I going to? then the God that I worship, well, maybe he's just too small. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians, we saw this already, chapter 6, verse 14, by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us up also. By his power, in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So God is able to do that. God is capable of resurrecting people. Well, then what body do they come in? What, what is the quality of this body? Well, it's going to be a transformed body. We'll see this in just a moment. One that is made suitable for dwelling in eternity. It's going to be transformed. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21 says... Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like his glorious body. So the body that we have will be a transformed body, and it will be like his glorious body. But Paul goes on to speak, and he says in verses 36 through 38, Foolish ones, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. God gives it a body as he pleases and to each seed its own body. So he begins by saying, foolish ones, um, you fool is literally what he's saying. He's actually deriding those who would reject the doctrine of resurrection. That word fool speaks of someone who is slow to understand. And he's saying, why cannot you learn the lessons that nature itself teaches? Why do you have to make the question bigger than it actually is? You see, 
as we all know, often spiritual insights are given simply by using nature as an illustration. Jesus did that. Jesus was speaking to uh, a man by the name of Nicodemus who had come to him by night. I used to say Nick by night, but I don't even know if that shows on anymore. Nick at night. But Nicodemus had come and had spoken to the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he had come and spoken to him, he had started the conversation by saying, we know that you're a teacher who's come from God. No one can perform those works, those signs, those miracles that you perform unless God is with him. And and then Jesus began to speak to him and in speaking to him began to use some natural illustrations. And you remember that? He spoke concerning natural birth. He spoke of, of, of a man being born of woman in order to illustrate natural birth, illustrating spiritual birth. The man needs to be born of water, meaning breaking the water as we uh, understand it today. When a child is born, he breaks the water. A man needs to be naturally born before he can be spiritually born. So he speaks of a natural birth to illustrate spiritual birth. Later on, he speaks concerning the wind. The wind goes where it wants to. He says, you, you see the, the evidence of the wind, but you don't know where it's coming from and you don't know where it's going to. So he used nature very often to illustrate spiritual insights. Uh, when Jesus would speak, and he did so on more than one occasion, concerning the power of the word of God, he would often use uh, the illustration of a man going out and sowing seed. And he's basically using a natural illustration to illustrate a spiritual truth. Uh, He illustrated compassion by referring to caring for an ox or a donkey that had fallen into a pit. Which of you has an ox or a donkey falling into a pit, even though it's the Shabbat, even though it's Sabbath? Don't you go and help it out? And so he would use nature to illustrate spiritual truth. Uh, To illustrate God's seeking heart, he used an illustration of of a lost sheep and a shepherd pursuing it or or a, a, a lost coin, or a, a lost son even. And he, he spoke in the, in the natural to give a spiritual uh, insight. And so it was common for Jesus to illustrate using natural events in our lives. And, and Paul is doing that. He's illustrating resurrection. And so to illustrate the resurrection, Paul says that it's similar to planting, growing, and harvesting crops. So in verse 36, what you sow is not made alive first, he said, unless it dies. Seeds, in order to germinate, must first be planted or buried, and then what do they do? They decompose. So he's using that as an illustration. And and when that seed decomposes, it ceases to exist in its present form before it can come to life in its final form. And so you go and you are planting uh, you know, some vegetable or whatever, and you drop the seed into the ground, and it goes in the ground as a seed, but eventually becomes a stalk and it produces some kind of vegetable or some kind of fruit. So it it went into the ground in one form, it breaks up and then comes, if you will, in a different form. And that's what he's saying. So seed in order to germinate must first be planted and decomposed. It needs to cease to exist in its present form. In verse 37, he says, And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be but mere grain. The seed ceases appearing as a seed, but ultimately... It appears as a plant, so it changes in appearance until it's in its finished likeness. Resurrected bodies will be the finished product. So we, like a seed, will be planted in the ground, is his illustration, but we're going to come out in that final form. He says in verse 38, God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. So wheat, barley, oats, whatever kind of seed produces its own kind of plant. Each seed produces what it has the capacity to produce according to God's design. Each plant will retain its own identity, and resurrection bodies will too. People will ask, have asked this question more than once. I'll just answer it real quickly here. And I think I might have already alluded to and perhaps even answered it before, but they've asked the question, will we recognize one another in heaven? Well, that depends if you go. But will we? Yes, of course. Um, Now we know in part, but then we're going to know completely. And so we will recognize one another. We will see one another, and we will know one another, and we won't be in a hurry, so we'll be able to fellowship with one another. It's going to be great. 
We're going to have a good time. So yes, of course, we're going to know one another. A resurrection body will have a continuity with the bodies that we have now. Our bodies will die. They're going to change, but they're going to still be our bodies. And as an illustration, verse 39, he says, all flesh is not the same flesh. There's one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fish, another of birds. So he begins to just basically break up what uh, flesh is all about, what kinds of fleshes there are. There's, there's natural flesh. Men have one kind of flesh, a uh, beast, a bird, a uh, fish. They all have different kinds. And that's all he's saying. All flesh is not the same kind. But he also goes into nature and speaks about celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. So when he speaks of the celestial, that's the sun, that's the moon, that's the stars. And he's saying they have their own special glory. When he speaks of terrestrial, that speaks of earth and that would speak of the flower or mountain oceans. They have their own glory. Uh, they differ because they're simply different. And so as way of illustration, he says, verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. And so the body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown in natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body. There's a spiritual body. And so the resurrection of the dead, the body is sown in corruption. When he says the body is sown in corruption, our bodies decompose. And the reason our bodies decompose is simply because of the fall, the fall of Adam. Um, Genesis in chapter 3, verse 19 says, In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust shall you return. Our bodies are made for the earth, and ultimately they'll be planted like a seed. They're made specifically for, for living here. But let's face it, they're going downhill every day. Do I have any people here who like to suntan? Raise your hand. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's okay. Go on. Raise it high. Yeah, I like the sun. Yeah. I know more of you like it. You're lying. <laughs> yeah. If I said, you want to go to Hawaii, you know, and you say, oh, no, I don't like the sun. <laughs> oh, you want to go to Hawaii? Yeah. What do you do in Hawaii? Well, for those who've gone, you do nothing. That's why Hawaii is a lot of fun. <laughs> You do nothing. You go out onto a beach and you kind of lay there and you protect yourself from getting harpooned, you know, and say, look, a beach whale. And no, it's Pastor Dave. You know, uh, I, when I was a kid, I mean, it's story time. When, when I was a kid in high school, they did have high schools back then. When I was a kid and they had high school. It was a big thing for us in high school. During the summer, I never wore shoes. I only wore shorts, and I normally didn't have a T-shirt on. And we would hitchhike to the beach several times a week. I grew up in Norwalk. And so we could hitchhike, before I had my driver's license, we would hitchhike to Beach Boulevard. And from Beach Boulevard, we would take it all the way into the beach. And so we'd get there probably within an hour of leaving the house because it was easy at that time to get rides. We'd arrive at the beach around 10 o'clock, and we would lay out on that beach until 3 or 4 in the afternoon. And then we'd hitchhike back home, and I'd get home around 5 or 6. And I did that several times a week. There were a lot of reasons for doing that. We, we used to, at the end of uh, the summer... We always wore our shorts kind of longer so that when we put on our gym shorts, you could see the difference of, of the tan line uh, and that white, white, pasty skin. And then people would say, man, you spent a lot of time in the beach, didn't you? And we'd say, yeah, far out. And, and that's what we did. You will not believe this. I know you won't, but I'm going to, you know, it's the truth. As light as my skin is, and people look at me and they say, that man's vanilla. As light as my skin is, I used to get as dark as a chocolate bar. 
just a little bit, just a, li a little lighter. We'd put Hershey chocolate on our stomach and it could almost blend in because I was in the sun that much. I mean, I loved it. And so every day I had, I had all these, this deep tan all the time for years. And I'm saying that to say this, don't do that. <laughs> It's not smart because I have cancer now. And, and, you know, I had this thing in my head. I'm Mexican. Yeah, but you're also very white. So I thought, you know, I'm immune from it, you know. I, but that's just not true. And so now, if you look, I've got skin cancer right here. I have to go in and have it removed in April. And, and, and my doctor said, and you know, you've got some more things we're going to work on. That's all from loving that sun. That's what it's from. When we were little kids, we used to go to the roof, top of our house, and we played paratroopers. We would put mattresses, and we would jump off the roof onto the mattresses with sheets. My mom would come out, and she'd say, what are you kids doing? And we'd go, Geronimo, and we'd jump off the house and thinking that these sheets were breaking our fall. And we would hit the ground and roll, and we did that all the time. I mean, that's kind of the stuff we did. I played football all of my life, and I didn't use pads. We played a lot of pickup games. We didn't use pads. And so when you got hit, you got hit hard. And the guys would pick you up and slam you. That was my youth. Played a lot of sports, did a lot of athletic things. Now my back is killing me. <laughs> because your body is corrupt. Because it breaks down with, with use. There was a time when I would sit down and I would eat three jelly, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I would wash it down, not with milk, but with milk and ice cream. And I didn't gain a pound. I graduated high school at my present height at 135 pounds. I didn't gain an ounce for a long time. <laughs> I used to try to gain weight. They had this stuff that was called weight gain. And I would drink it to try and gain weight. I couldn't gain weight. I was... I was so skinny that when I stood and stuck my tongue out and you saw my shadow, I looked like a zipper. I mean, I was skinny. I wore skis in my shower so I wouldn't go down the drain. I was real skinny. My pinstripe suit had one pinstripe. I was very skinny. No more. I look at food and my eyes get fat. So I'm telling you, your body, your body is corrupt it is your body's corrupt we know that and yet when you're young you really don't know that you really don't because when i was young you know 18 19 20 21 22 i thought i would always be just this thin guy who could just do whatever i wanted whenever i wanted because like i said i was very athletic so i was able to do all kinds of things I didn't have to work out. It just was very natural for me to do all these things. And yet, what was I saying? See, your memory goes too. <laughs> Corrupt bodies. Corrupt bodies. Paul is speaking about the bodies that we have because they are fashioned for earth. But they're not fashioned for heaven. They have to be transformed. They have to be changed. It's like when you go to a pool or you go into the ocean, go into a lake, your body is specially made to take its oxygen in through breathing air. You go under the water and you hold your breath because you can't take in oxygen from the water. You're suited for one environment. And for us, we're suited for the earth. 
we have a natural body. This natural body is corrupt. It Live long enough, and you see how corrupt it is. Live long enough, and you discover how it doesn't heal up like it used to. They say that when you get over 60, everybody who's over 60 eventually falls down. That's true. I fell down the stairs. You know how when you fall, even if nobody's around, you kind of laugh and look around to see who saw you? <laughs> I fell down the stairs and nobody was home. And I was going, ah, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> The second thing I did was, Mommy, Mommy, where's Marie? I need someone to carry me. I broke my foot. I broke it in November of last year, not, not even last year, the year before. It is still not healed yet my right foot. They say I have to go to the doctor to have it casted. I say, nay. <laughs> I'll just hobble around, poor weak little old man that I am. <laughs> I used to jump out of planes. Now I fall downstairs. <laughs> Your body needs, well, we need a new body. As much as we think, listen, when you're 18, 19, 20, you think you'll always be in that condition. Nope. Nope. I got married. I weighed 155 pounds. Marie worked until um, 9. She would come home and make a full dinner at 10 at night. And because we were newlyweds, I couldn't tell her. Please don't make so much food. So I gained almost 20 pounds in like five weeks. <laughs> and she says to me, whatever happened to that thin waist? <laughs> That's a memory. And I've never been able to go back to the weight I used to have. Your body just does that, doesn't it? Some of you youngsters out there are saying, oh, really? That's my future? I might as well kill myself now. <laughs> but it is. But it is. That's just the way it is. We need new bodies. And that's what we're going to receive. And so that's what Paul is speaking about here, resurre resurrection bodies. A resurrection body. <clears throat> God is going to give to us one. It's going to have a continuity with the bodies that we now have. Our bodies will change, and they will change form, but they're still going to be our bodies. You see, when he says in verse 39, all flesh is not the same, there's one kind of flesh, well, obviously, they're going to be different. They're going to be different. Different uh, the way that uh, there are different kinds of flesh, as we saw. There are also celestial bodies, and there are terrestrial. Well, that's the point he's making. So is the resurrection of the, de the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It's raised in incorruption. Resurrection bodies differ from earthly bodies, but how is that? Well, in verse 42, uh, so also is the resurrection of the dead, the body sown in corruption, it's raised in, in corruption. When it says the body is sown in corruption, uh, he's simply saying the obvious, our bodies decompose. And the reason our bodies decompose is because of the fall. Like it says, Ecclesiastes 3.20, all go to one place, all are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. When Jesus was speaking on one occasion when Lazarus had died and had been placed uh, in the tomb, uh, in John eleven thirty nine, 39, Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time he stinks. He's been dead for four days. So our bodies decompose, which is a result of the fall. But in contrast, the resurrection body will never perish. He says that in verse 54. We'll see that next time we're together. But in verse 54 here in the same chapter, when this corruptible has put on incorruption, this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And so the resurrection body is a body that will never perish. In verse 43, he said it is sown in dishonor. So the body that is planted is not what God intended it to become. He didn't intend our body to decay. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 15 and 16 says, 
as he came forth from his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came, and shall take nothing of his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. This also is a sore evil, that in all points as he came, so shall he go. And what profit has he that has labored for the wind? So it's sown in dishonor, but in the resurrection, this weak, decaying body will be glorified. It is raised in glory. Daniel speaks about that in chapter 12, verse 3, when he says, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heaven, and those who lead, lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. In verse 43, he says, it is sown in weakness. Our bodies are physically weak. Our bodies are vulnerable to illness. Again, you know, we used to get so, I was so in love with the sun. Just went out there and I used to put on different kinds of oils, coconut oil, motor oil, I mean all kinds of oil. <laughs> we used to put cooking oil on too to get the sun. And now I have to go in, as I was mentioning in one of the services today, um, next, week, next month I have to go and have another operation, a surgical procedure, to remove cancer that I have on my face here right now. And they found other, uh, other cancers on my body. And I'm not concerned, by the way, and I hope it doesn't come off like I am, because I'm not. But what an inconvenience. You know, what an inconvenience, man. I hate it. I hate going in, you know, and, and yet you do. And they're going to be having to cut it out and st stitch me up and all kinds of great things. So I understand about it being sown in weakness. Our, our bodies are physically weak. They're vulnerable to illness. When resurrected, though, we'll no longer be vulnerable to pain and no longer be vulnerable to any sickness at all. Again, we used to jump off the roof. And my mom would come out and say, what's wrong with you guys? And say, nothing. And we'd jump off the roof and hit and roll. And, and now I fall out of bed and I have to be carried to the bathroom. You know, it's, it's entirely different. You know, but that's what happens with your, with your body. It gets old. But that's one of the promises that the Lord gives to us that is beautiful. In Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 3, <laughs> Uh, we read, he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, uh, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. His servants shall serve him. What is sown, verse 44? Well, it is sown as a natural body. The realm of our existence, what we know, and what we are now on earth is what he's speaking about when he speaks of a natural body. Our spirit resides in what is called a natural body. But then we shall have a glorified spiritual body. This spiritual glorified body will be perfectly suited to live in heaven. He says in verse 45, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And is the heavenly man so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Paul refers to Adam. Adam was created with a natural body, not a spiritual body. Jesus, Jesus is called the last Adam. He's the obedient man who passed the test and gives spiritual life. Adam fell, as we know. And when Adam fell, he passed on his sin nature to all who would be born. In Romans 5, verse 19, uh, Paul writes, For just as 
through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners. So also, through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. When Adam fell, he, be, he was, he's referred to theologically as the federal head of mankind. So when Adam fell, his nature has been passed on to us. So we have received his nature. That's the reason why we all die. In Romans 5.12, Paul had said, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, in this way, death came to all men, because all sinned. All sinned in Adam. Adam, by having children, would pass on his nature. Like begets like. And because Adam had a fallen nature, all who have been born from Adam and Eve will all have the same fallen nature. The one who did not fail and the one who did not fall is Jesus Christ. And because he didn't fall and didn't fail, Jesus gives us life, and that's where we get this new nature. That's what is being referred to when it speaks concerning being born again. That term, being born again, speaks of this spiritual rebirth that we have. We're born with fallen nature, and the wages of sin is death. But God gives to us eternal life through Jesus Christ. So we have been born with a fallen nature. That's why Jesus said that a man needs to be born again in order to see and in order to enter into the kingdom of God. So it doesn't really matter how religious that person is. If they don't receive a new nature, they are still lost. You can take a, a, a chimpanzee and you can train them to do various things and even put a tuxedo on it. But it's still a chimpanzee. It's a nice looking one, probably the best one in the junk, but it's a chimpanzee. And, and it's well dressed and well trained, but by nature, that's what it is. Human beings, and I don't want to sound in any way as if I'm mocking those who don't know the Lord because God knows I'm not. But we can dress up our flesh as much as we want and we can become as nice as, as possible and, and all of us have dear friends and loved ones who are great people and we love them to pieces. They're our relatives, they're our friends, co-workers, neighbors. We love them to pieces. There's no judgment on them at all. Sometimes I have seen unbelievers People who would say, I don't have a relationship with God. I don't even know if I believe in one. Who actually live a quality of life that puts some believers to shame. You've seen it and so have I. One survey I read a few years ago was that atheists have a lower divorce rate very often. This one study, lower divorce rate than born again believers. Atheists. Which I found very challenging, to be honest with you, and very discouraging. But I don't think that's taken into consideration of how many people who, who got born again or became born again actually received their divorces prior to getting saved. And as a result, were broken and came to Christ because they were so torn up. But the bottom line is, is there are some very nice people out there, aren't they, who don't know Jesus at all. Generous people, loving people, caring people, sacrificial people. Not everybody's as bad as they can be. There are some real nice people out there, and we're related to them, and we hang around with them, we work with them. They're in our neighborhoods very often. And then there are the other little stinkers who obviously need God. And so what we have is we have people who have a need for the Lord. So when we're born again, that's because we have a need, because we recognize that we have fallen natures. We know that we have sin and fall short of the glory of God. And so Jesus, who did not fall, gives to us the nature, a new nature that we need. It, in Romans 5.21, it says, Just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Romans 5.15 says, the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? So we have received from Christ, who is called the second Adam, a new nature. That's what Jesus is referring to when he speaks concerning being born again. Unless a man is born again, he cannot see, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. We have Jesus who's called the last Adam who never failed. We have the first Adam who did. The first Adam gives to us his fallen nature, but Jesus saves us. And so he's contrasting the two. He says in verse 48, as was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. And so knowing that the spiritual is not first, every human being from Adam on started life natural, not spiritual. That's why Jesus would say, unless a man is born again, he cannot see or enter into the kingdom of heaven. We know that we need to be born again. And so when we're born again in our resurrection, we will receive that uh, new body, that spiritual body. The first man, according to verse 47, was of the earth. Adam was created out of the dust of the earth, as Scripture says. But Jesus, on the other hand, existed as God before his incarnation. So, as was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. We receive our human bodies from Adam, but our glorified bodies come through Jesus Christ. And we shall receive glorified bodies in the resurrection. Someone said in heaven, one size fits all. I'm not sure if that's true or not. Do you look forward to that? I do. I do. There's one uh, benefit to be given long life that I can imagine. I know there are a variety of others, of course. But it gives us an opportunity to rejoice at the reality of the promise of God that when we enter into the kingdom of God as in heaven, there's no more pain, no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more injuries, no more disease. We'll have a full set of teeth that's ours. <laughs> Your back won't hurt anymore. You'll run and not faint. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? What a joy that's going to be. When you're young, you don't. And I understand that. I was young. Now I'm old. I remember what it was like to get up and say, I think I'll go run a few miles today. And now I know what it's like to wake up and say, man, I'm too tired to drive a few miles. <laughs> And I'll stay up all night, I'd say when I was, it's, it's, it's New Year's. I'm going to stay awake all night. And now I'll tell Marie, man, it's 10 o'clock. Let's go to bed. <laughs> I used to roll out of bed. Now I roll out of bed. <laughs> it's just entirely different. It really is. But you want to know something, man, one of these days, and it won't be long. The Lord is going to give to us brand new bodies in heaven, one size fits all. And it's going to be a glorious experience for us. Somebody said, how old are we going to be in heaven? I don't know why you ask. No, I, I don't know, but I suspect it's going to be whatever a perfect age would be. Will we wear glasses in heaven? No. Will we have fillings in our teeth? No. Will we even have all our teeth? Yeah. Arthritis? No. It's just going to be great. 
I mean, I think about it once in a while. As I grow a little older, I'm starting to think about it a little more. Not that much yet. I think should the Lord give me 20 more years, I'll think of it every day. But right now, I think of it once in a while. And I'm just excited about it. I'm excited about all that God's promises are. One of these days, this corruptible will put on incorruption. One of these days, you know, there'll be no more tears. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more illness, no more pain, no more death. Because, because death is swallowed up in life. And so when Paul is speaking, he's saying, listen, God is going to give you a glorified body. You drop a seed into the ground. It goes in the ground as a seed, but it dies and produces a plant. And this plant has fruit. And what God has done with us is he's taken us in Christ. And we are dead in Christ. Nevertheless, I live. So I'm alive because of him. And even though the bodies that we have right now, over time, get old, tired, get ready to be planted, one of these days, and really in, in comparison to eternity, it's not that long for anybody in this room, one of these days, we'll put on that new body and that is perfectly suitable to dwell in heaven, and we will be with him forever. No more crying, no more pain, no more sickness, no more hurting, no more illness, no more tears. Just joy. Swallowed up in victory because we're with Jesus. That comes because we have a relationship with him now. 